Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, today's session, like I mentioned, challenges in structured document data. And that is very specific and important because despite us being in the world of unstructured data, a lot of it actually is structured and pretty complex when you look at you know, PDFs and a lot of documents that are forms or legal or have to be in a specific format. If you've ever tried to extract that, <laughs> that is not easy. So we're very lucky to have our guest speaker here. He is the co-founder and CEO of Unstract, an open source uh, startup building a cool LLM powered platform that extracts data from unstructured documents. And again, really structured documents, helping automate critical business processes because uh, this is really complex. Before he uh, co-founded Unstract, who's the VP for Platforms Engineering at Freshworks, also an electronic hobbyist. Oh, I should have uh, showed you some new uh, circuits I got today. <laughs> They're sitting on my desk here. Uh, and uh, he no longer voluntary correct spelling and grammar mistakes committed by others. Wow, that's a tough one. I, I applaud you for that. Welcome. Oh, let's get started. Share your slides and I will hide in the background. Thank you, uh, Tim. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, let me share my screen and then uh, you go from there. Um, so a quick uh, background on, you know, what, uh, you know, we'll be looking at, uh, looking at today. Right? So I have like a little agenda slide that we can quickly go through. So when it comes to you know, PDF documents, which are structured, unstructured, it doesn't really matter, right? So what happens is that there are businesses out there that deal with these kind of unstructured documents almost on a daily basis, right? And so, but what happens is that there's, there's current technology available to structure those, those PDF documents or even other formats, it doesn't really matter. Could be Word document, could be a PowerPoint, could be Excel sheet, doesn't really matter. But there are limitations with those current systems, right? So usually you'll, you, the, the largest limitation out there is you'll have to manually annotate the document before you can start extraction, which is a huge problem, right? Uh, think of, for example, a, a business dealing with, uh, let's say, uh, giving out loans. And uh, what happens is that, let's say, to figure out if you, the kind of eligibility that you have, let's say you need to submit a bank statement, right? And that, that business uh, financial organization needs to accept bank statements. What happens if they get 300 different applications and those 300 different applications submit bank statements from 300 different banks? Is it okay? to go manually annotate all those 300 bank statements. It, it, I mean, it's just not possible, right? So that's the limitation of the current system. But here's the here's the really cool thing, right? Large language models can help overcome overcome that uh, need for manual annotation, right? So Unstract is, uh, is an open source platform that helps with that. And we'll see, uh, you know, how it works, but also, right? It would be unfair to say that, hey, this is like a, a panacea, right? So large language models do have their limitations, and then we'll see what those limitations are, right? Uh, I will introduce the Unstract platform. Uh, we'll spend a, we'll spend maybe 10 minutes quickly going through uh, what it is and how it works and all of that. And then I want to come to the, the meat of the talk, uh, where we'll spend most of our time today, right? That's where the marriage between large language models and, uh, uh, you know, vector databases comes in. Uh, in. In this particular case, I'll be using Milverse uh, as a managed instance on the Zillis cloud, uh, which is an awesome service. I, in fact, I signed up and I got like a $100 uh, credit, which is awesome, right? So I'm, I'm hoping Tim will give me more, but I do have $100 to begin with, which, which, which makes me feel pretty rich. Um, so, but but we will get into the weeds here because I want to show you what happens when you are trying to extract data from unstructured documents without a vector database. Then we'll introduce a vector database and we'll see how that goes. But then we will we'll go into a little bit more detail and differentiate what happens when you use a 
simple retrieval strategy. And then we look at a slightly more sophisticated strategy, which we call sub-question retrieval. And if you, if you don't fully understand all of this, I, I will uh, take time to walk walk you through some of uh, how this works and, and stuff like that. For some of you, it may it may be uh, things that you have already heard, but you know, for the rest of the for the for the rest of the audience, I hope you'll be patient as I explain some of this stuff, right? But more importantly, I want to talk from uh, an angle of practicality, right? So look, we we deal with around you know. Uh, 5 million pages a month at this point of time as a platform. That's what we help extract, right? So we have a, a lot of data. We've seen a lot of corner cases. Uh, we've seen large language models deployed uh, at scale in production, right? So would love to give you some of those insights uh, as to what works well, what doesn't work well, and things like that. It, it, this is a very interesting uh, application, a very practical application of large language models that you can monetize today, right? Um, this is about me. I, I don't want to spend time here. We have a, a very packed agenda today, so we will get going. But but I mean, you know where to find me in case you want to, uh, you know, chat up even after the, the this webinar, right? So there are a lot of challenges in dealing with 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 PDFs in general. So you have tables, sometimes you have PDF forms. Now these forms can have check boxes and radio buttons, and they can have multi-column layouts. And then you can have scanned documents as well. Sometimes scanned documents are properly scanned, meaning someone's used a flatbed scanner, they put in a document there, they scanned it. Those scans are usually not a problem. You can deal with them pretty easily. But then, hey, you know, after, of course, now that people have smartphones, and they just whip them out and then they click a photo of a receipt or what have you, right? They, they could pretty much, uh, you know, do anything, uh, you know, with their smartphone, click click a photo of a form, a document, a receipt or, or anything. But the problem is that there could be skew, you, you know, uh, lighting problems, all sorts of things that we will still have to deal with. And the worst of the worst are handwritten, scanned forms right which are which are also super difficult to deal with these are some of the things that we deal with on on a on a day to day basis we we need to pull structured information from all of these types of documents right now in in the real world within the same document type right so a bank statement is a document type a resume is a, is a document type an insurance policy is a document type although we say a type you will find a wide ranging variety between these document types. And that's where the challenge comes in. That's where large language models come in. Large language models are way better than machine learning models when it comes to this, and they can do a really, really good job, right? Like how a human would do. Like for example, if I gave you two bank statements from two different banks, you're not looking for, oh, in this location, 50 comma 100 X and Y, I will find the customer name. Then I'll find the customer address at this location. You're not thinking like that. As humans, we we just think of we think in terms of language, right? When we read a bank statement, we just read a bank statement. We know what's the customer name, we know what's her address, we know what, where the the transaction table starts, right? We just know it. Large language models pretty much follow this. I mean, they kind of very similar in, in the way they approach, uh, you, you know, extracting structured data out of unstructured documents, which is awesome, right? Very human like, right? Um, and the other problem, you know, the impact could be that, hey, you know, when, when people manually extract data, it's super slow, super expensive, very error prone as well, right? Now, but we, we have a very interesting opportunity here, right? As people who work with large language models, let's say this little uh, oval here uh, represents all the problems that are solved by current incumbent technology, right? There is a huge, huge unsolved market out there, which we can solve using large language models, right? Very, very easily, right? But there's also more that can be solved, which is not solved currently by large language models. So this is, this is what I was talking about. Hey, what are the limitations of large language models, right? So we have customers ask us, oh, we have bar charts and these graphs and charts and uh, pie charts and all, all sorts of stuff in, in financial statements. Can you also, you know, turn that into structured data? The answer is that the state of the art is not there yet. 
So even if you take a, a very simple bar chart or a you know pie chart, a lot of times if you take a simple screenshot of that, paste it into uh, let's say even Chat GPT and ask it to turn that into structured data, you will find that it makes a lot of mistakes a lot of times. And if you do this enough, you'll know that it's the success rate is just not there for you to put it into production, right? So, um, but but still, right? What we can solve using large language models is a humongous market, and with, and this market is currently being served hundred percent manually, and it's slow, expensive, and error prone, right? So that's something that we can solve using LLMs, right? So um, think about take a step back, right? Think about how are people making money today with large language models? Let, let's think about that for just a moment, right? Now people talk about you know insane valuations that startups are getting and people talk about solving boiling the ocean with large language models but if you really think about where large language models are being deployed practically and solving real problems and you know the companies behind those solutions are making money there are very very few and far in between right we'll walk through some of them because it, hey as Practitioners, this is still very interesting information. Practitioners, and I'm sure there are leaders as well, right? Now, I, I think that the number one use case for large language models, which is monetizable today, is the enterprise search, right? Where you use large language models and vector databases to, you know, get data in and then do search. There's security involved, all sorts of stuff, really. But then this is a very interesting use case. And the number two use case is customer service, right? So typically, uh you know you know what you could do with a human uh, there is a knowledge base people are trained on uh, you know company product information and then other humans either call them or chat with them uh, over some kind of a chat box and then those folks answering this, this is like super ripe for uh, disruption by large language models and we we, have, we see that this is already happening right and chat bots just after large language models they just became so good that you know it's hard to differentiate uh, you know whether we are talking to a human or a chatbot right and i think the number three largest horizontal use cases in software engineering especially with uh, with code uh, uh, you know copilots right so now github copilot code em tab 9 you have a bunch of them they're doing a really really good job i use them on a daily basis so do my colleagues and and a lot of my friends in in, in many different organizations who are into software development now this is this is real uh, impact, right? And a lot of boilerplate code, honestly, nobody really writes, writes, uh, writes uh, when they use this, this kind of uh, stuff, right? And we believe that the number four horizontally monetizable large language model use case is really structuring unstructured data from these structured and unstructured documents, right? Now, of course, there's other interesting companies that, that, that are doing the same for sales and marketing and, and, and things like that, but this is where I think with LLMs, organizations have solutions that make money today and solve real problems, right? Now, of course, uh, talking about agents, they, I think they are out in the future, uh, right? Because of the compounding error rates, right? If if you take input from LLM, feed it to another, another uh, you know, another use case, and then that to another use case, errors tend to compound, and this is a big problem for agents. And people are trying to solve this, but I'm sure that they will solve it. But right now, I don't see any uh, monetization happening around that. Right now, look here's the thing, right? There's a difference between copilots and unstruct, right? There's nothing stopping you from uploading a document to ChatGPT and asking it to structure it. There's a couple of problems there. What is the structure it will come up with? For every time you ask it, it will give you a different structure, and then you have a human in the loop, meaning that the information is now on a screen which a human is viewing, but the data is probably required somewhere else, right? In a, in a system where, you know, for example, if a if some kind of a, you know, bank is using, is getting a bunch of documents from you uh, so that they can give you a loan, they need that information in their backend system so that they can process your application, right? Now you can't have a human, of course, you know, you can, you can have a human copy and paste some data from a copilot but first is they have to verify whether the data data is correct there is no hallucination right and then 
while copying and pasting they can copy the wrong field over and they can make a mistake there and also the other uh, problem is that they may have to transpose some data change the format of a date of a currency or whatever and mistakes can happen there right so definitely a step up from doing it 100 percent manually but then again you know uh, not the best uh, possible use use of this technology right with unstract what you are looking at is what we call as machine to machine automation where we take uh, unstructured uh, documents structure them and uh, push them into where it's actually required we you can either do eight etl pipelines or you can do apis uh, to get the structured data into the system where it's required now of course there's the problem of hallucination and all that but we'll talk about how we deal with that right we feel this is more uh, complete automation right now there's three different generations of uh, uh, the way you structure data from various unstructured documents we have ocr which is just hey you know this is pure digitization there is no intelligence there then you have machine learning based models which usually use computer vision and a host of other techniques to uh, read documents nlp based ner those kind of things but the problem is they're definitely better than ocr but they're pretty brittle right and and uh, the current systems that operate at scale you, they need annotations for for this kind of system to really work well right but like i said the way humans handle documents is just using knowledge just using language we just read a document and we figure out what is what and then you can do you can emulate the same using large language models and that is what uh, systems like unstract uh, leverage the ability for large language model to reason the ability uh, that they have to follow instructions which is our prompts using which you know we can structure unstructured documents right now unstract itself is uh, is an open source platform uh, and you can bring your own llm stack uh, right so you choose your uh, large language model you choose your vector database embedding model text extraction system it's really up to you because we want you to be in control uh, right for example there could be some use cases where you want the best of the best model some use cases where there's anywhere human in the loop you want to just speed it up so you can use a cheaper model a more or less uh, capable model it, it really depends on the viability of the use case and then and, and what you have to choose uh, of course we we support uh, we've been supporting milvers i think very very early on and and zillis cloud as well uh, pretty much the, the open source offering works the cloud offering works is pretty well tested with with uh, Melvus and Zillus, right? Now, think of Unstract as two separate, distinct phases. Phase one is where you provide a representative sample into what we call as Prompt Studio. So you go to Prompt Studio, you give an uh, example. So let's take the, the 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 bank statement example, right? Give it statements from different banks, 15, 20 different statements. Then you do the prompt engineering and Prompt Studio will help you to write generic prompts to extract key fields from those documents, name of the customer, address of the customer, account number, the transaction uh, information, all of that stuff, right? So you, you do the generic prompt engineering, that's one. Once you are happy with the prompt engineering, you can then, you come to then through the deployment phase where you launch it as an ETL pipeline or an API endpoint. Right, so you like let's say you you launch it as an API endpoint, you send a bank statement, you get structured JSON data back. Right, that's the that's the general idea. So you know you you have to remember that the, these are two distinct phases. Right, now we we spoke about hallucinations, right, and we were a little bit worried about the hallucinations. This is where LLM challenge comes in. Uh, Unstruct uses two large language models, and both of them have to come to a consensus. Otherwise, we will <clears throat> fill up the value of a particular field being extracted to null, right? Because we believe that a null value is better than a wrong value. That's our philosophy, right? We, so we, we kind of uh, stick to that. Uh, that's where LLM challenge comes in. So there is no hallucination possible because two different large language models from two different separate vendors, they cannot hallucinate the same value and agree on it. That never happens, right? So. That's why that there's, you don't have to worry about hallucinations in Unstract, right? Now, as far as cost is concerned, we have two other technologies called single pass extraction and summarized extraction, which reduce, which again, use a large language model to compress your prompt, compress the document, uh, reduce uh, both latency and, and cost. So this is in, in general, uh, you know, these are some of the features that we have to uh, help 
uh, you, you know, uh, practically deploy large language models in production, right? Uh, typically, you get up to 7x savings when you turn on these features. Uh, that's how these work, right? Now, moving on, uh, like I said, let's move on to the meat of the discussion and how uh, things work. I will give you a quick overview of the uh, the Unstract platform, and we will we will take one particular use case and we'll see how that works, and then we'll deploy we'll have that deployed as an API, and then we'll give it a document, and then we'll see what kind of response we get, and then you know we we'll take it from there, and and then we'll move on to the different strategies you can use with uh, vector databases. In this case, uh, we will use the list cloud, and we'll see what the impact is on uh, you know structuring these documents using uh, Zillis, right? Um, so this is the the platform. So here we have uh, Prompt Studio. We have a um, bunch of uh, Prompt Studio projects here. If this will load, let me refresh this. So what we want to do is that I want to show you like a quick tour of uh, a prompt studio and and uh, how whether where the various components are how things work and then what we'll do is that uh, we will go through uh, one particular use case especially I want to show you the the API and and how it works and then we'll take it from there it's taking a lot of time let me go have another instance let me check this one out okay this load Demos, right? <laughs> okay. This is taking time. That's okay. Let's move on. I'll show you some of the things that we'll do. Okay. Now, what we want to do is basically extract structured information from some documents. Now, in this particular case, I have uh, two large language models uh, configured. I have a, a 10Q form uh, from Apple. These are just, uh, uh, you know, standard uh, forms uh, that public companies file with the SEC every quarter. And they have a huge bunch of information. But in general, we are interested in, uh, I think we are trying to extract 10 different uh, items, right? So the name of the registrant, uh, I have the JSON field. So ultimately, right, I want to convert this document into uh, this format of JSON, where we have the registrant name, the uh, the commission file number, jurisdiction state, state employee ID, the address, uh, telephone number, security details, and and also the risks and risk factors and the income details for this quarter and the same quarter last year, right? Um, this is what we, we are trying to do, right? So in, in this particular case, uh, I have two large language models configured. Uh, one is uh, GPT-4 Turbo and the other one is Claude Instant 1.2. And uh, for each of the prompts, you can see the cost is actually pretty high, uh, right? The reason is that this document is actually converted to this raw view, uh, right? Uh, as you can see, we, we call this uh, layout preserving technology, which is our uh, text extractor LLM Whisperer. And when you preserve the layout, it turns out that large language models are really good at reading this kind of stuff, right? So rather than just a text dump, when you preserve the layout, we quite literally insert text uh, to be able to to be able to do that, right? So um, so in this particular case, uh, you know, we are not using a vector database. So what is happening is that every time we are trying to extract uh, something, uh, the whole context, this whole context is sent to a, a large language model. That's the reason why the cost is very high and the, the tokens are very high as well, right? Uh, you can see the same for the file number, jurisdiction, state. This, these are all text fields that we're extracting and you can compare the different extractions by the, the two different large language models we have. Then we are getting the address here. Uh, so we are getting the, the address, the state and the zip code uh, separately, the city as well. And we can also look at the um, 
uh, the different, uh, I mean, you can compare between these two large language model extractions, right? Now, um, when it comes to more complex types, we have a JSON field. So there's various types of fields here, text number, email, Boolean data, and all that. Now, when you set this to JSON, and when you you can you can in the prompt you simply describe the JSON you want. We do the extra prompt engineering required to uh, to basically uh, you know ensure that you do get JSON output, right? And then we have the disclosures here, then the income details. This is a slightly more complex prompt, right? So we are saying that for the current quarter, get me the name of the quarter, the net sales, net income. And then we have some extra instructions here as well. And uh, turns out that, uh, you know, Milvus is really, really good at this, right? So even though you have a complex prompt, uh, I can actually look at uh, the chunks used here, uh, right? And, and, and I, can, I can see what kind of uh, data is being returned from the vector database. But in this particular example, we are not using a vector database, right? For some reason, Claude is, is failing. But uh, GPT is giving a response, and I have verified that this is this is indeed the the correct response, right? And then we have risk factors and things like that, right? Now let's look at uh, 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 you, let's basically deploy this as an API. Uh, so what you can do in in Unstacked is that <clears throat> excuse me, so you can export this as a tool, and you can then deploy this as an API. So if you go to APIs here, I have uh, one endpoint per prompt studio project right so let's take for example uh, the project that we were just looking at right where we are not using a vector database we are simply uh, you know sending the whole document for every prompt to every prompt for every prompt extraction every field extraction right so this is what we're doing now i have this loaded uh, in uh, you know my uh, postman here so if you go to uh, Postman collection, so in fact, what you can do is that for every API, you can simply download a Postman collection to call this API. And of course, you can manage the keys. You can also see the code snippets to, to call this API. So to remind you again, uh, this particular API endpoint uh, does not use a vector database. So we'll see what the cost is for such an extraction. That's the general idea, right? So if I go back to Postman, uh, I've loaded this in, in Postman, this particular, the no vector DB uh, endpoint, right? And I quite literally send one, uh, the latest Apple uh, 10Q report for uh, quarter two of this year, and I send it over to the API, and I should get uh, structured uh, JSON data back, right? That's the general idea, right? Now I've turned on uh, metadata, meaning it will return the chunks as well, uh, which were sent to the large language model for extraction, right? So you can see uh, that the chunks are there. I'm gonna skip this whole section down and come down, right? So now we send the document over and got structured data back, right? So we have the output here. We got the address, we got the file number, the disclosures, the income details, for the you know uh, June ending quarter this year and then last year as well, and uh, the other uh, details like uh, risk factors, security details, and all that, right? But very importantly, what I want to draw your attention to is that since we did not use uh, Milvus in this particular example, our cost is through the roof. For a simple extraction like this, we have blown over a quarter million tokens, right? Because we use the whole context without using a vector database. And then uh, we have like 799 output tokens as well. Uh, but then, like I said, we've blown close to $3 in this particular, for this particular use case, uh, right? Of course, we also spent some on embedding, but the embedding cost is not, uh, not very high. Uh, right, but this is this is a lot, uh, right? And but luckily, right, we can use uh, Zillis Cloud in this particular uh, case, and and we can see how we can quite simply reduce the cost of of this, right? Now let me go back to Unstract, right? 
and look at uh, some other projects I have, right? And we look at the same example, which we looked at earlier, but with, uh, you know, Zill is enabled, right? If you look at the settings for this particular project, I've configured uh, GPT-4 as, as, the, as the default extractor. And then I also have Claude Instant 1.2 as a secondary extractor, just to compare uh, them side by side. I'm using the Azure OpenAI ADA for the embedding. And uh, I'm using Milvus on Zillis Cloud uh, for the vector database, right? And I'm using LLM Whisperer in text mode as the text extractor, right? Now, the text extractor basically converts this document into this kind of a view, uh, right? Where we are preserving the format and then the tables are you know, beautifully preserved, which, which is super important for large language models, uh, right? And there we go. We have the exact same things again, right? So 10 different prompts, starting with register name, uh, file file ID and all that, right? So we have all of this. And we can even, uh, in this particular case, I think I've also enabled a challenger, LLM challenge using Gemini Pro. So it's challenging the extraction. And you can see that here, right? Uh, this is the input. And then you can see that the input is very small because now, uh, vector database is involved and you can see how the price can really drop now right so uh, it's a, it's a, it's it's very small context now so there's the extraction and then there's a challenge which generates a score for each of the extractions city state zip code full address everything got five out of five which is awesome we love perfect grades and then uh, yeah the result is finally set to this right so that is llm challenge in action um now you can see that the cost has dramatically come down. Of course, you can also see that Claude is a lot cheaper than GPT-4. Uh, and you can see that from like 87,000 uh, tokens, now the tokens have dropped to mere thousands, right? How is this happening? This is happening because we have turned on uh, the vector database in this particular case. Let me go through some of the uh, details here. Uh, let me edit this. So we have a chunk size of 1024. We have an overlap of 128. And we are using a simple retrieval strategy in this particular example. I want to go through what simple is versus the other thing. In just a bit, I'll, I'll revert to the pre presentation to walk you through this. Right? Now, um, if you look at this here, we'll, you can click on this and also you can also look at the uh, the chunks used. Right? Now, in this particular case, we have asked for, uh, if you look at the prompt, what is the address of the registrant form a JSON object with the following fields, full address, city, state, zip code. And then this is first sent to the vector database where the whole document uh, raw text lives. This is like the full raw text, but the full raw text is not used in the extraction. Uh, this, this question, the prompt is first sent to the vector database, in, in this case to Zillis Cloud, and then Zillis Cloud responds back with uh, these chunks. And if you look at this here, this is the exact chunk we need because uh, you know it, it has the address for the principal office and all that. So it's now Zillis has figured out, hey, this is the chunk which is relevant. And then I'm sure there's other chunks where there's addresses present and things like that, because this is how the system actually works and and, and basically uh, milvus is looking for you know uh, addresses basically from from uh, from the whole document getting relevant chunks but uh, you can see how tremendously uh, you know the the cost has now dropped right um now let's do one thing i have this this one the simple retrieval also launched as an api you can see this one here right this 10q parser simple retrieval I'm going to go to Postman here. Let me close this. Now, or let me keep this open because I want to uh, co compare and contrast with this, this cost here, right? So let me open this simple retrieval uh, endpoint, right? And I will send over the same file, the Apple 10Q, send it to this API, which is now using uh, Milvus. And there you go. This time, if you see the chunks are also very small, right? The whole document is not present, right? Because I've enabled metadata, you see all this. 
Otherwise, generally the API doesn't respond with all this, right? Now coming to the cost, what a huge difference, right? The cost has gone down from $2.86 to just uh, 36 cents, right? I think that's like a 8x reduction in cost, right? That's what you do, that's what you get by just turning on, uh, you know, uh, uh, the vector database uh, and, and using even something like a simple retriever, right? But let me go back and, and talk a little bit about, uh, you know, retrieval and especially simple retrieval and let's, let's, let's go through how this whole thing works. Now, I know that some of you may be advanced users here, but you will have to bear with me for the, you know, rest of, rest of the audience among us who may not be familiar with this, who may be new to vector databases, right? So bear with me here. Uh, in general, what happens is that we take a query or a prompt. In this case, let's say we're trying to extract the address. You saw that prompt. It was a pretty simple prompt. We send it to an embedding model. And then we have already the document stored in, in the vector database. Then we ask the vector database, given this particular prompt, what are the relevant chunks, right? And those chunks are retrieved. Uh, and then combined with the with the user prompt sent to a large language model and we get the response from the large language model this is what rag actually is right so but this is a very simplistic right this is what we call as a simple retrieval meaning that we simply take the query and send it to uh, you know uh, the vector database along with the uh, and get the and get the get the chunks and then uh, use it now the the very weak point here that you have you, you have to understand that vector databases, right, they have strengths and weaknesses. If you send the vector database a very, very complex prompt and hope that it will figure out, uh, you know, uh, the right chunks to send you, then that's a, that's a huge problem, right? So we'll look at a example of a prompt that shouldn't be sent directly to a vector database, right? Vector databases are specialized in arranging information in retrieving information, arranging inter information in a vector space, and then retrieving the right information that you need. That's that's what vector databases, uh, they, that's their strength, right? So we shouldn't expect them to uh, give you like the relevant chunks by just giving them a very complicated prompt, right? That's not the right way to approach the prompt, right? We look at how how, how and why, why that is, right? Now, so if you look at like the simple, a, a, a retrieval strategy that we just use, meaning that we take the prompt and directly send it after embedding to a, a vector database, ask for relevant chunks. There are some advantages and disadvantages there, right? So simple retrieval strategy is pretty much like RAG, what, whatever the slide that we just went through, right? Now it works well when the prompt is simple. There's a direct correlation between your prompt and what you want to extract. Like there is no lot of information about how to format, what to avoid. So prompts can be really long, right? But what you need to extract can can just be somewhere in the prompt, uh, you know, and that that's usually a problem, right? For simple prompts like we had, this this works really well, right? Now, uh, for a simple uh, st uh, retrieval strategy, right? For simple prompts, you should be able to get the get the right chunks right uh, your mileage may vary but usually you should be able to get the right chunks right now th this will be a cheaper approach uh, right because what you're doing is that you're taking the question embedding it sending it to the vector database you're getting relevant chunks sending it to the large language model and you're pretty much done right now what happens when the prompt itself is very complex right we we look at some of those uh, some of those uh, cases and then come back to the to the presentation right now I have another project which has a uh, sub question retrieval enabled. I'll show you where that is done. And I'll also show you what a sub question retrieval is and how, how that might work. So if you go to settings here and this time you, you say edit, now you can see that the retrieval strategy, I've changed it from simple to sub question, right? So that's all you, you need to do in unstract. Now with sub question retrieval, what basically happens is that we use a large language model to take this prompt and convert this to a bunch of sub questions as to what to retrieve, 
right? So let's say you send it a, a large prompt like this, right? We are not send we are not sending the the vector database the uh, the 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 single prompt, but then what we are doing is that we are sending this prompt to a large language model and asking it what should be extracted. Give me give that to me as separate questions. Then we have a loop where in that loop we send all the sub questions generated by the LLM from the prompt and asking the, the vector database to give us the relevant chunks. Then once we have all the chunks, we're looking for duplicate chunks, we're removing them. Then we use those chunks, uh, send it to a large language model along with the question, and hopefully we'll have better results, right? Now, this, this take, for example, you know, this particular prompt it's, it's slightly more complicated than a simple prompt like what is the address of the registrant it's not as simple so here we have from the con condensed consolidated statement of operations or income statements respond with the following json object and these are all the things that we're asking and we have further instructions here right now if you really think about this if you send you know these instructions to a vector database it's not going to give you any relevant fields right we simply need the relevant fields are for us consolidated statements of operations or income statements that that's all we are interested in right so we are not really interested in uh, you know this portion here so sub question retrieval actually works better in this case because when we send this prompt to a large language model and ask it hey, what is the user trying to extract, right? And then the large language model is probably going to respond with two questions. What is the consolidated, uh, condensed consolidated statement of operations? And what is the income statement? What is the income statements, right? So probably we're gonna get two. And then we go into a loop, we take these sub questions, ask the vector database to give us chunks related to these sub questions, then take all those chunks, remove duplicates, take that along with this prompt, send to a large language model and get the response. So very likely we'll get a good response. Now in this particular case, we are getting a good response uh, uh, irrespectively, right? Because it is simple enough. It's only like 90 pages and then we are still getting a good response, right? So let's let's look at let's look at the but I'm very interested to know the cost of of this particular uh, uh, strategy, right? So let's go back to our uh, you know uh, postman postman here. So if you look at uh, you know uh, not using any vector database, it's at two point eight dollars. Uh, using a simple uh, retrieval strategy, it is at uh, 30, uh, 36 cents. And let's go to a uh, sub question uh, parser here, right? Uh, and then I have this open. Let me send this the same file over to uh, this particular API endpoint, which uses a sub, -quest sub question retrieval strategy. And this time we have larger chunks, right? Because we have more, more chunks this time, which means that the cost is going to increase. And as you can see, we have spent uh, 50 cents this time because you can you can quite easily see it's a larger context compared to let's say this context, which is which is a lot shorter compared to that one, right? So um, so 50 cents, but the the results like like I said in this particular use case, right? The results are actually looking pretty good. No problem here, right? We got everything we wanted, security details, risk factors, all the right details, and then even the, the income from the current quarter and the, same, and the same quarter last year, we did get good results. But now we will twist this, right? What we'll do is we'll make simple strategy fail. How do we do that? We'll make the prompt very, very complex, right? Now to tell you one thing, right? Of course, this if you take a look at this particular project, there are 10 prompts, right? And then this means that we'll have to call the large language model 10 times, not a good idea, right? No professional prompt studio project will actually look like this. 
it'll be it's usually very very compressed right because we want to save tokens we want to save latency uh, right so let's look at for example the same project the same 10 fields we want to extract uh, or rather the core information we want to extract so we have something called the compact 10q parser with simple retrieval let's go look at this right so this is this now this becomes very interesting i have a single prompt here now what i've done is hey i've said create a json object of the following structure with json objects under it now this time we have disclosures income details and risk factors and i'm describing the individual json objects here in the same prompt i'm saying disclosure this is how the they, they, the sub object should look like income details this is how it should look like right risk factors it's a it's a fairly simple one right now i have again two uh, large language models configured uh, this time it's it's not using a lot of tokens as you can see but then uh, if you look at the results i am seeing null here let me let me open expand this up take a look at the 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 response from these two large language models side by side first of all we did not get the the right uh, values right we got null here right that is that is very sad but then again if you look at uh, a net income and uh, here this is actually wrong we know that from the previous prompts right so it was 654 and 157 something like that this is also wrong right now the problem is we are using a simple strategy so you go to settings here and look at the strategy we are using is a simple retrieval strategy the problem is this prompt the whole large prompt is being sent to the vector database and we are asking give me relevant chunks and the chunks along with the prompt are being sent to both these large language models and turns out that we did not get the right chunks so if you look at these chunks we are not finding any financial data that we need we probably finding some risk information right but we are not finding the right financial data and that's why we are seeing null here right so this is to be expected right so we have to understand how to use the vector database correctly which is super important right now i have the very same project no change is made exactly the same prompt but with sub question retrieval so a complex prompt right the same complex prompt but this time what i have done is that in the settings I have switched from a uh, simple retrieval to sub question retrieval. Now, what happens is that, like I explained earlier, we use a large language model to and ask ask it to generate sub questions, which are then sent to uh, you know the the vector database. And this time, if you look at it, we have the right values from both the large language models. Of course, there's a difference because the way the large language models are summarizing the risk are different right we are asking it to highly summarize it right we said highly summarized value so claude is like going overboard and really really summarizing uh, you know highly it's generating a very concise summary whereas uh, gpt4 is still keeping the summary a little bit more uh, uh, you know verbose right so but hey the great thing is now what's happened is that although uh, the prompt is exactly the same simply by switching from simple retrieval to sub question retrieval we got the the right answers right so which is awesome right so yeah so now I, i'm hoping that you know you got a good idea about you know uh, the unstrack platform but also about uh, milvers and and how you can use it to reduce cost right so let's quickly summarize it and then we're kind of uh, almost on time here we'll take some questions so we had the simple retrieval strategy but then we also have the sub sub question retrieval strategy excuse me and where we use a large language model you know to uh, generate retrieval related sub questions and in a loop uh, we ask the the vector database for relevant chunks we eliminate duplicates uh, of course uh, you know 
the you are you are also realize that the reason why simple strategy failed is because you know these chunks are all over the document uh, right so it it, it it was struggling to get the right chunks without uh, you know sub questions right and uh, you know of course uh, if you really look at the the summary of the whole uh, the discussion here was that if you look at the full document you usually get very high accuracy because the large language model tends to have the full context in this case it was only 30 pages or so so it would fit into the context of a large language model but the problem is the cost although the accuracy is going to be really really high but it's not going to be viable if you use it at scale right then came simple retrieval uh, it, it is the the lowest cost because uh, typically you just get a few chunks and then you ask a large language model what it is and then it's, it's going to answer in in our case it was like 8x less than you know the full document so this is where vector databases really shine for uh, structuring use cases um, but in general for simple retrieval you can't expect great accuracy uh, especially when the prompts get more and more complex um, usually you should avoid using this strategy uh, it's okay for quick testing and stuff like that uh, it's usually faster because a large language model is not involved in generating sub questions so you you tend to save some time and you know some cost but then again it's not the best uh, retrieval strategy out there uh, sub question strategy on the on the other hand just makes things so much better right so it understands the prompts it generates the necessary sub questions it asks the large language model you get pretty high accuracy not as good as the full document because nothing can beat having having all the information all the context but then again you know uh, it comes a close second as far as accuracy is concerned and then you know you you can really uh, leverage the power of a vector database along with large language models to to kind of uh, solve for this particular use case right so um, that's our discussion here we have some time i'll hand it back over to tim to see you know what we can do yeah we have uh, we have some questions uh fortunately your colleague uh, naren has been answering some of them but uh let me see which ones we uh haven't uh, answered how about this one from Aaron Cohen? Does your system report the confidence level for ex the extraction or allow for manual review and fine tuning? That, that, that is correct, Aaron. So uh, LLM challenge generates a score using a large language, second large language model for the extraction of the first. And uh, manual review is also something that is there in the system. So you can set the destination of a uh, of a prompt studio project as a manual review queue where you get the source document and the extracted value side by side if you click on the extracted value it will highlight it irrespective of whether the value has changed or not uh, the format you know you could have changed significantly it doesn't matter it will uh, i mean highlight it in in the in the source document uh, right so uh, and, and yeah you you can you can always do that yes okay we got another one uh, so is Unstract different from unstructured IO and Llama Parse in that with those you get generic extractions, even if they are powered by LMs, while well, Unstract allows you to specify prompts for field of interest. That is correct. So unstructured IO and Llama Parse are text extraction services. So you you prepare documents for consumption by large language models. So and and Unstract is purpose built for unstructured uh, data extraction, structured data extraction from unstructured documents. So LLM Whisperer is the equivalent of unstructured IO and Llama parts, but the, o the open source unstruct platform is a lot more. And then you have LLM challenge and all the other, other stuff as well. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, that one was answered. Are we trying to extract exact values or summaries analysis? Probably both are possible. Yeah, both are possible, right? So you want to e extract exact values, and which is super important, right? So when you structure unstructured documents, you you want to do that repeatably. That's where you know Prompt Studio comes in. Very cool. I think we got time for one more here. Can you comment more on reliability of getting LLM to decompose 
complex query into sub questions? What is the accuracy and success rate? That's a great question, right? So here's the thing, right? This is where LLMs and vector databases work in tandem, right? And you have to tune your prompt, give it a lot of document. That's why you can load a lot of sample documents in Prompt Studio. I said representative sample. So you have to give number one, a good representative sample. Usually we recommend 15 to 20 documents, which are within the same document type, a huge variation. And then tweak the prompts, make sure that you're getting good chunks from the from the vector database. You can view them in the UI. Make sure that they you, you are indeed getting good chunks. And then you know you you tweak your prompts and you, you ensure that you indeed are getting depending on the large language model the quality of the sub questions will change and uh, based on you know what you're trying to extract you will have to kind of fine tune and then go from there pretty cool um this one's interesting i don't know what they were referring to maybe this will make sense to you oscar monroe asked interested in current model architectures that are being showcased for use of my own projects will this be available the concepts were great yeah, so uh, I, I'm assuming that you have some kind of a fine-tuned model yourself. Yeah, so one of the uh, connectors that Unstract has is uh, the uh, Olama connector. So you can host your model on Olama, connect to it, uh, and and yeah, so absolutely, that's something you you can do. Very cool. I think we're out of time. I think that was pretty awesome webinar. We got a bunch of good questions. Decent number of people attended. We will provide the slides and we will provide the uh, recording of this pretty soon. And it was great having you here. And I can't wait to, we have Unstract in person. I'm going to make you go through some of my documents maybe. And then we'll uh, we'll have uh, a cool uh, meet up there. But uh, thanks for everybody for coming. Thanks for the great questions. And uh, we will see you I think we got another webinar next week. We'll put that in there. There's a ton of great stuff going on. And thanks again. Everyone. Thank you for hosting us. Yeah, Thank you. anytime. It was awesome. Bye. See you, everyone.